My name is Josh Atkins, and today I'll be presenting the biomechanical analysis of the in-step soccer kick, focusing on horizontal ball velocity and the critical factors that influence it. One of the primary goals is to achieve high ball velocity, especially for power kicks such as shots on goal. This requires the efficient transfer of momentum through the proximal to distal sequence to maximize foot speed at impact. Contact time between the foot and the ball should be short but powerful, ensuring efficient force transfer. Additionally, the foot must be positioned correctly to hit the ball at the optimal point, enhancing both velocity and accuracy. The deterministic model here shows various factors that contribute to the horizontal ball velocity, such as foot impulse, approach speed and linear foot velocity. Foot contact time and knee angular velocity and hip torque also play important roles in energy transfer and overall performance. For the purpose of this analysis, we will be focusing on what contributes to momentum, foot impulse, skill and segmental coordination. Specifically, foot contact time, linear foot velocity, the angular velocity, foot impact or place of foot contact, and proximal to distal sequencing. Foot speed to impact and contact time is essential to increasing ball velocity. A higher foot speed generates more force, and shorter but powerful contact times allow for efficient energy transfer. The impulse-momentum relationship demonstrates that increasing the force applied to the ball and not increasing contact during will result in higher ball velocity. Proximal to distal sequencing ensures smooth momentum transfer from larger to smaller segments, optimizing foot velocity at impact. So with our phases of the kick, these can be broken down into three phases. The three phases of the backswing, forward swing, and impact phase. In the backswing phase, we have the pelvis externally rotated towards the kicking leg, and the knees flexes positioning the lower leg behind the body. In the forward swing phase, the thigh comes through, the knee rapidly extends, driving the lower leg forward. As the knee extends, preparing for impact, the foot reaches maximal velocity just before the contact of the ball, and that's important to remember. In the impact phase, the foot makes contact with the ball and the energy transfer happens there. The leg then continues to swing forward all while energy is dissipating and we are maintaining our balance. So with our proximal to distal sequencing, you can see there's quite a lot going on here. So just for ease of flow, we'll see that here are our main components. So when we go through starting at the initiation phase, we then have our backswing phase, going through our forward swing, we have pre-impact, impact, and then the follow through. So when we're looking at optimal technique of the skill, Nanume and colleagues conducted a detailed study on the biomechanics of a soccer kick, focusing on how skilled players can maximize ball velocity. This study involved nine experienced male soccer players who performed maximal effort in step kick. The researchers specifically observed the high frequency movements of the foot and shank during the ball impact, which are critical for effectively transferring momentum from the leg to the ball. One of the key takeaways from this study is the concept of kicking through the ball. This technique is more than just striking the ball with force. It's about maintaining control by positioning the foot correctly, following through after impact. By doing so, players ensure that momentum is carried directly through the ball, leading to higher velocities and more effective shots. These findings suggest that coaching cues like kick through the ball can help athletes focus on maintaining high foot speeds and stability at impact, which are crucial for enhancing ball velocity. For trainers and players, this emphasizes the importance of foot and leg control during the final phase of the kick, where even small adjustments can lead to higher velocity and more accurate accurate strikes. Sean and Westeroff conducted a comparative study to analyze the biomechanics of the soccer kick across skill levels. Their study involved two groups of male participants, a novice group with eight players who had minimal soccer experience, and a skilled group with seven players who averaged around 12 years of experience. Each participant performed six maximal in-step kicks, which allowed their researchers to compare differences in technique and movement patterns. One of the standout findings from this study is the role of the upper body coordination in enhancing kicking power and ball velocity. Skill players exhibited what Sean and Westeroff described as the tension arc, a coordinated upper body movement that stores and releases energy, amplifying the power of the kick. This upper body involvement significantly boosted the speed and force behind the ball, showcasing how important it is to align both upper and lower body movements during a kick. Their research suggested that training should address not only the lower body mechanisms, such as hip and knee movement, but also upper body coordination. For players looking to increase their kicking power, this means incorporating exercises that improve upper body strength, flexibility, and control control, all of which contribute to higher velocity and more accurate kicks. So the optimal technique for recording. To capture the biomechanics of a soccer kick accurately, setting up a camera in an environment properly is crucial. First, let's talk about the frame rate. 
A high frame rate of over 120 frames per second is recommended to capture the rapid movement involved in the kick. This ensures we don't miss any of the finer details, particularly in high speed segments like the impact fade. Next, camera position plays an essential role. Positioning the camera in a sagittal plane or side view allows us to capture the entire kicking motion, focusing on key joints like the hip, knee, and ankle. This viewpoint provides a clear perspective on how each segment moves through the kick. Distance from the subject is also important. Keeping the camera 10 to 15 meters away ensures that a full motion is captured without sacrificing detail. Then we have lighting and background. Proper lighting minimizes motion blur, while plain backgrounds improve the visibility of body landmarks, making it easier to track movement precisely. Finally, calibration and scaling are essential for accurate measurements. A calibration object such as a one meter ruler should be placed within the camera's view. This reference allows us to scale the measurements and ensure that the data we capture is reliable. Together, these setup elements help us analyze the kick accurately, providing insight into movement patterns and areas for improvement. So observing performance while filming. We had the performer stand in the sagittal plane, so we were able to get the most accurate view. Markers were placed on the femoral head of the kicking leg, lateral tibial plateau and malleolus of the kicking leg, lateral aspect of the calcaneus and fifth metaphalangeal joint of the kicking foot. For the calibration, we used a meter ruler, and this was placed directly next to where our participant was kicking. So some other considerations, it was filmed on a cloudy day and on a running track. The participant wore dark clothes and we filmed at a frame rate of 240 frames per second, so well above what is recommended in literature. When observing the performance for skill, the performer had three kick attempts of a maximal kick. They were able to self-select their own run up and the length at which they ran as well. With time between kicks, the participant was giving adequate rest of up to three minutes. This was to greatly decrease fatigue while still being able to give a maximal effort. Fatigue between kicks was reported as low to none. Knee angular velocity was calculated by identifying and finding the peak relative knee flexion, followed by the degree of knee flexion at the time of ball contact. The knee had a clockwise rotation of 493 degrees per second. When comparing the participant's knee angular velocity to that recorded by Nanume and colleagues, where they had nine experienced male soccer players that had been instructed for kicking maximal distance. We can see here that the participant is low skilled and greatly underperformed in comparison. Knee angular velocity is crucial in accelerating the lower leg and foot, and research by Nanume showed that peak knee angular velocity significantly influences foot speed at impact, contributing to increased ball velocity. Skilled players, as Sean and Wesseroff observed, exhibit higher knee velocities during the forward swing, ensuring efficient energy transfer. Linear foot velocity is another key determinant of ball velocity. According to Lees and Nolan, higher foot speed at impact directly correlates with greater ball velocity. Nanuma and colleagues found that rapid knee extension increases foot velocity, peaking just before impact. However, balancing foot speed with accuracy is essential for effective kicking. As you can see here, wherein red is the linear foot velocity and yellow is the horizontal ball velocity, the intersection of the ball and foot contact are not intersected at the foot's peak velocity. This is due to a slowing occurrence when the foot begins to slow prior to contact with the ball and continues to slow thereafter. Our participant measured a lower velocity than those measured by the Nume's nine experienced players. Foot contact time is brief but crucial. According to Lees and Nolan, shorter contact times with higher force application lead to more effective energy transfer. Nanuma and colleagues found that optimal contact times range between 10 and 15 milliseconds. Sean and Restoroff found that skilled players understand how to strike slightly below the ball center to optimize trajectory and speed. Proper proximal to distal sequencing ensures a smooth and powerful transfer of momentum. As highlighted by Kellis and Cadis, skilled players show better coordination, resulting in higher ball velocity. Sean and Westeroff observed that effective timing of the knee extension and hip flexion is key to generating greater foot velocity. This is where the whip-like motion or successful tension arc results in a smoother momentum transfer for higher velocity and accurate kicks of the ball. Firstly, to increase knee angular velocity, we can do this through strength and power training. As an example, plyometrics or resistance training. With our linear velocity, we want to optimize our foot velocity with coordination drills and high speed repetition. High foot speed at impact equals more powerful kicks. When it comes to contact time with the ball, 
We want to shorten the contact time with explosive power exercises. These can be done with exercises such as box or broad jumps and power cleans. With our foot to ball contact, we want to focus on striking the ball with the instep for maximal power. With instep contact, we have greater force and greater velocity. With our proximal to distal sequencing, we want to improve the timing of movement sequencing through coordinated drills and mobility exercises. Better sequencing equals increased foot velocity and more powerful kicks via an increased tension arc. In this study, limitations include potential parallax and perspective errors during motion analysis. Multiple studies looked at maximal ball velocity analyzing the ankle to toe angular velocity. This was not implemented in this analysis.